Good morning. I've studied this before, and we're going to talk about Moses striking the rock this morning. And there was there was one word when when Jason Pereira was here. We spent a lot of time looking up words in the Strong's, see what it meant in Hebrew, and see what it meant in Greek. And there was there was one word that changed everything for this message today. I'm I'm excited to tell you about it. So turn over to Exodus chapter 17. What do you think of when I say the rock? Dwayne Johnson. No. <laughs> Jesus, right? Not Dwayne Johnson. <laughs> the rock. Okay. Exodus chapter 17, verse 1. The whole Israelite community set out for the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses replied, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. And they said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and our livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did it in the sight of the elders of Israel and he called the place, place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? How many of you guys have heard that story before? If you, I mean, if you've been in church any time at all, you've probably heard this story. Uh, some of you guys might not have heard this story, but on the surface, the story is about the Israelites. Uh, they're going through the desert. It's hot and it's dry and they can't find water. Surprise, it's a desert. So they're just thirsty. And then when they don't have water, they start to complain. Pretty basic story, right? Okay. We're going to go a little deeper this morning on... On this, uh, and there's one word in here that's going to change everything. I am so excited to tell you about it, but we got we got to wait. I, I want to tell you right now, but we got to we got to wait just a little bit. All right, so um, we got to we got to give a little backstory first and talk about uh, covenant promises. So 400 years after the flood, God talked to a man named Abraham, um, and he made a promise to Abraham. He made he promised a Abraham. A nation, a land, and a seed. And the rest of the Bible is all about God making good on those promises. That there would be a nation, a land, and a seed. Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. The promises... I just told you what the promises were, right? Nation, land, and the seed. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. Amen. What I mean is this. The law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus... Do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. Why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed, capital S, to whom the seed is Christ, right? Until the seed to whom the promise referred has come. Has the seed been here? Yeah, the seed has come, right? He did. The law was given... Let me read that one more time. Why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred has come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implies more than one party, but God is one. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But Scripture has locked up everything under control of sin 
so that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. So how do we get the promises of God? We just believe in Jesus Christ. That's it. It's not by anything we do. It's not by anything we earn. God makes promises. And all we have to do is believe that God is a God who is faithful, a God who keeps His Word, a God who keeps His promises. We believe in Jesus Christ, and that's how we get any promises that, the, that God gives us out of this book right here, by faith in Jesus Christ. Promised land. A promised a promise land is just land that is promised from God. Duh, right? <laughs> In A.D. 135, the Romans, they booted the Jews out of their promised land. And they didn't go back to live there until 1948. Oh my gosh. 1,800 years they were outside of the land that was promised to them by God. So, guys, if... Uh, this is a miracle, because if, if someone comes in to your country, takes it over, disperses your people out, you know, then after a few generations, those people, they don't, they're, not, they're not a nation anymore. They, those people go away. But the Jew, just after maybe 100 years, those people are all mixed in with the other people that took them up. And they, I mean, they're gone. But the Jews went 1,800 years because God made a promise. Have you ever met a Jebusite? Have you ever met a Canaanite? Ever met a Hittite or a Morite? No. As soon as their land got taken over by someone else after a few generations, they're gone. The only way, the only people that's ever done this, ever, is the Jewish people. It lasted 1,800 years, and that's because God made a promise. And He keeps His word, He's faithful. He's a good God. So, even God made a promise to Abraham. The dude was old. How's it going to happen to kids? I don't, so, on his own, that's not possible. But God made that possible. He has a son, Isaac. Isaac has Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons, which become the 12 tribes of Israel. And boom, you have a promised nation. God keeps his promise. So how did they get to be slaves in Egypt? You guys know the story, the one son, uh, Joseph. The other brothers were jealous of him. Uh, he was the favorite son. He gets thrown into a pit or a well, and they rip his coat up, and they put blood all over it, and they come back home, and they tell their dad, he, man, he got smoked. <laughs> He's gone. <laughs> Of course, he's upset, and then uh, some people come by, and they get him out of the pit, but then they make him a slave, and, he, and then he gets into some trouble with somebody's wife. He was doing good. Favor of God is still on him, follows him everywhere he goes, but then he gets thrown in prison, and then he interprets a dream of the Pharaoh is how he finally gets out, and he talks about how there's a famine coming, and you've got you to gotta be ready. You've got to prepare for this famine. So the Pharaoh thinks Joseph is pretty nifty, likes him. And he makes him his right-hand man. Then, the nice, after a while, man, the, the, the Jewish people, they're, they got to be, they multiplied. <laughs> okay? They were fr fruitful and they multiplied in the land of Egypt. Okay, so then there's a whole bunch of them. But then the nice Pharaoh died. And then a, a meaner Pharaoh <laughs> comes in and he rules and he enslaves them. Okay, so... For 400 years, they're enslaved in Egypt. And then, then God sends Moses, and he takes them out. And you got all the plagues and everything. They leave Egypt. The Egyptians bless them with gold and silver. So they, they leave. No one leaves poor. Everyone's, everyone's with God in, in, in abundance, exceedingly abundantly above all. So here we go. We've been set free. The Egyptians blessed us with gold and silver. And they went, and then the Egyptians changed their mind, tried to come get them. You guys know the story. The Red Sea got parted. They went through on dry land. And then the, the army would come to get them, and then, boosh, the, the waves washed over and killed the whole Egyptian army. 
Man, that, and so, wow, God is with us. And so I want to read this. We're going to go back to Exodus 17, but I'm going to go back to 15. It's just a couple chap chapters before, really like one page. I'll show you how fast all this happens. Chapter 15, right there at the beginning of fi chapter 15 is the first place in worship service. They just got through there and they sing this, this whole song to God, verse 19, and when, when Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and horsemen went into the sea, the Lord threw the waters of the sea back over them, but the Israelites walked through on dry ground. Then Miriam, the prophet, Aaron's sister, took a, a timbrel in her hand, and all the women followed her with timbrels and dancing. Praise and worship, man. They sang a song to the Lord. Okay, so that all just happened, man. They, they, they saw the ten plagues. They got delivered from slavery, the Red Sea part. They got delivered from the whole Egyptian army. Woo! Man, that's awesome. Then it says that all that just happened. Verse 22, Then Moses led from the Israel Sea, and they went to the desert of Shur for three days. This is three days later after they saw the Red Sea part, guys. Three days. They traveled in the desert without finding water, and when they came to Marah, they could not drink the water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Marah. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood, and he threw it into the water, and the water became Fuji water. <laughs> they could drink it, it was good. Let me tell you how this feels, okay? To put it in perspective for you guys. You know that feeling when you pour a bowl of cereal and then you open the door to the refrigerator and there's no milk? <laughs> right? You know that feeling? You know that feeling first thing in the morning when you're, when you're, when you're trying to hurry up, you only got a few minutes, you got to get on the road to get to work and, you, and your keys are not where you set them. You know that feeling? <laughs> You know that feeling if you've, if you've ever gotten your car to start it and you turn the key and it just clicks? <gasps> it's not a good feeling, is it? Sometimes those things happen and sometimes in a stressful moment like that, we'll grumble. Right? I do. No one else grumbles. Whatever, guys. <laughs> no, we grumble. It's, it's an understandable thing. I mean, you, you expect something to be there. Uh, you just, it, you always kind of just know it's just going to be there. I mean, I, you pour a bowl of cereal, you know there's milk in the refrigerator, man. I'm dying, you know. That's a terrible feeling. But see, they were in Egypt, and they lived right by the Nile, and so there's always water. There's always water to make bricks. There's always water for the crops. There's always water for all the livestock. There's always water. Never even thought about not having water because it's something that we always have. It's always there. And so when it's not there, I want it back now. Where's the water? So we, we grumble. And look, man, God made us. He knows, I mean, we, he's not surprised when we grumble, okay? Okay, turn back over to Exodus chapter 17. Chapter 17, the whole Israelite community set out for the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded, and they camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink, so they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. It wasn't just grumbling now, now they quarreled. And I looked that word up. Sometimes God just directs you, like, look that word up in the Strong's. I don't go through and look them all up, guys. I just, sometimes I'm like, mom. Oh. That wasn't in verse 15. They were without water in chapter 15, but they grumbled, which is to be expected. But then it, they quarreled. Were they arguing with most? I mean, what, what's the difference in grumbling and quarreling? So I looked that word up, and the word is Meribah. Remember, that's what they named the place, Meribah. Meribah means they filed an official complaint against Moses. They had a lawsuit against Moses saying that we don't have water, and it is your fault, and we are going to document that and put you on trial because you are killing us in the desert. Us, 
and our children and our livestock. So quarrel means meribah, it means to make a lawsuit or to file an official complaint against. It's, it's a lot more than just grumbling. They got together and they, and they drew up paperwork. No, man, this is a, hey, we want water now. We don't have it and it's your fault. Dude, it wasn't that long ago that we didn't have water and God was faithful. God saved us from slavery. God parted the Red Sea. He saved us from the whole Egyptian army. Not that, just a couple of days ago we didn't have water. And, and he made the water drinkable. God is able to take care of your needs. He can, he can give us water. So I can understand grumbling, but this is a whole new level. This quarreling against Moses. And so... This is, the, this, is the, this is the worst part. Moses is the representative of God. So their complaint that they filed is not against Moses. It's against God. It's your fault, God. We don't have water and it's all your fault. See, when we things happen in our life and we expect things to be, be there and Expect things to go a certain way, and we all do that. And we grumble. And that's to be expected. I mean, we shouldn't if we can, if we can pull it together, try to be thankful and grateful. But sometimes we grumble, if we're honest, we just grumble. But it's way different when you're like, I don't have my family back, it's all God's fault. I didn't get that job, and I don't know why God wouldn't just let me have that job. That's totally different than just grumbling about your situation. It's another level. It's an accusation against God. Verse 3 and 4. But the people were thirsty for water and they grumbled. So they're still complaining. They're still grumbling and complaining. But they filed an official complaint also. And they said, why do you bring us out of Egypt to make us and our children and our livestock die of thirst? And Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They are, they are almost ready to stone me. They are, hey man, they're about to find me guilty. They filed a complaint against me. They're going to kill me. What do, you, what do you want me to do? The Lord answered Moses, go in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand therefore before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and the water will come out of it so the people will have something to drink. God sets up a courtroom. He said, okay, they filed a complaint. Get the, get the elders together. Get the staff. Staff is a staff of authority. You're going to be the judge, Moses. I'm going to stand on the rock. And we're going to have court. This is crazy. This is how court is supposed to go, described in Deuteronomy chapter 25, when, verse 1. When people have a dispute, they are to take it to court, and the judge will decide the case, acquitting the innocent and condemning the guilty. If the guilty person deserves to be beaten, the judge shall make them lie down and have them flogged in the presence with a number of lashes the crime deserves. So God has set up a courtroom. He said, grab the staff. In case someone has to be punished, I will stand on in in on the rock, in front of the elders, in front of the, all the people, and we're going to have court. This is what Dr. Edmund Clowney describes the event. Before the face of Moses the judge, with his rod uplifted, stands the God of Israel. The Lord stands in the prisoner's dock. Moses cannot strike into the heart of God's Shekinah glory. God commands him to strike the rock. God, the rock identifies himself with the rock by standing on it. God stands in the place of the accused, and the penalty of the judgment is inflicted. Is God then guilty? No. It is the people who are guilty. In rebellion, they have refused to trust in his faithfulness. Yet God, the judge, bears the judgment. He receives the blow of their, that their rebellion deserves. The law must be satisfied. If God's people are to be spared, he must bear their punishment. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 1 through 4 For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors are all under the cloud 
and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And they all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual water. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Jesus is the rock. He's the righteous one, stands in place of guilty people, receives punishment they deserve. Jesus, the innocent. Jesus, the just, was treated as if he were unjust, so the unjust could be made just. Jesus was placed on trial by guilty people, sentenced by guilty people, executed by guilty people to redeem guilty people. God was falsely accused. Jesus was falsely accused. God stood on trial before men. Jesus stood on trial before men. God stood in the place of men. Jesus stood in the place of men. God was stricken. Jesus was stricken. God the innocent paid for the guilty. Jesus who knew no sin was made to be sin that we might become the righteousness of God. Before the Jews were allowed to enter the promised land, they received this picture of the gospel. God paid their fine. God paid their penalty. He took it all so that they could drink, so that they could live. Most of the Jews, they fail, they still, to this day, fail to grasp this. And they continually attempt to satisfy the justice of God through their self-righteous acts. Try to earn it. Try to work for it. It only comes by faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for you. They missed the gospel. They missed grace. Don't miss the grace. 